Uh, hello everyone. Um, just going to get right to it. Chapter three. <clears throat> I fumbled putting my tablet into its case. The loud scraping of my chair on the concrete floor echoed in the small space. No one was watching me. Their attention was back on the lesson in spite of my beeping monitor. I got out of the room as quickly as possible and recited the community creed as I walked down the hallways to the south elevator. What I wouldn't give to click back into the link again right now. After a few more recitations, the heart monitor finally stilled. But then, how many times had the monitor gone off today alone? I must have triggered an alert at Central Systems. I wanted to kick myself. How could I be so stupid, so careless? My finger paused before I put it to the small touch panel to, the, to call the elevator. I was still glitching. I wasn't going to be able to hide my secrets any longer. I'd be caught and repaired, or I could run away right now. I could get on the subway, take the connecting line, and try to get lost somewhere in the central city, disappear. My hands started shaking and a high-pitched hum echoed through my mind. Desperate, hopeless thoughts. I straightened my body, calming the fear and panic soaring through my limbs. Couldn't stay hidden forever. Everything in the city required either wrist trip or fingerprint access. I'd be found instantly. But then the streets and the hiding would be over. The loneliness and the nightmares would go away. I wouldn't be broken anymore. I would be just like everyone else, whole again, part of something. This was something that had to happen. I touched my finger to the panel to call the elevator before I could talk myself out of it and, he and heard the responding whir of the elevator coming down the shaft. There was no choice, not really. I stepped into the circular white elevator tube and watched the door slide shut behind me. Sublevel one, my voice shook. The elevator moved, but I could barely feel it. This was the right thing, I reminded myself. I was doing the right thing. Couldn't think about my drawings and the beauty and the happiness and all the things I'd lose. When the door slid silently open, I stepped out and followed the numbers on the wall to room A117. The door was open and light from inside spilled out into the hallway. Greetings, I called. Subject Zoel Q24 reporting. Come in, said a deep male voice. I took one last breath and stepped over the threshold into the room, but then I looked around me in surprise. It wasn't an exam room. It was a bedroom. There was a bed, desk, even ambient light lamps instead of the ceiling light lamps. I remember now that the school had a wing of residential rooms for people of importance traveling through. Then I saw the computer, computer and mobile diagnostic equipment in one corner. Had they called in the specialist to deal with me? How much did they know? My brow must have furrowed, registering my confusion, because the short, round man standing in the corner said, Come on, we just need to run a quick check on your systems. He was middle-aged with thinning brown hair and a sheen of sweat on his forehead. He wasn't wearing the regulation gray, but instead the black uniform and red insignia of the officials. High-ranking officials, class one and two. This wasn't just an ordinary diagnostic appointment. Have a seat. He, met, he motioned to a chair beside the equipment. I swallowed, trying not to let my fear show. An official here for an impromptu diagnostic check. Something was seriously wrong. That moment on the train platform, the boy with the aqua eyes, someone must have seen what I had done, ordered an instant deactivation. That had to be it. They probably wouldn't even try to fix me. It was all over. I forced my feet toward the gray chair and sat down. They said you were pretty. He smiled at me and dabbed at his forehead with a cloth as he came toward my chair. He took a small metal instrument off the equipment table. Excuse me, sir? I didn't understand his words, and I didn't understand the look on his face. Sir? Sir. He motioned, he smoothed down his sweat-slicked hair and organized the tools prepped and aligned on the desk. So respectful. Involuntarily, I frowned. For some reason I couldn't pin down, he made me feel uneasy. His behavior seemed anomalous, too. But then, I never met an official before. Obedience to officials was a community duty. Officials couldn't be anomalous. Could they? I had the strangest desire to get out of the chair and run back down the hallway to get away from him, no matter the consequences. You aren't in trouble. This is all quite routine. I tried to breathe normally so I wouldn't set off my heart monitor. Something felt wrong. Whatever he said, this was definitely not routine. The urge to run welled up again, but I forced myself to sit still. He was an official. I had to obey. The uneasy feeling only worsened as he moved behind me and lifted my curly ponytail. 
I knew what he was looking for, the axis port at the back of my neck. My chest constricted, cutting off my air. If there was anything wrong with my port, he was going to be able to see it, and if not, he would run the diagnostic and the scans would tell him everything. This must be what happens right before a subject gets deactivated. I glanced back at him and saw, saw him take a tiny data drive off the table. I just need to run a quick program, girly girl. You don't remember a thing. I didn't like the way he said, girly girl. I didn't like the tone of his voice or the look in, on his wide, red face. In fact, nothing about this felt right. Suddenly, obedience and duty were forgotten. I knew I had to get out there. Now. But just as I moved to get up from the chair and pull away from him, the man grabbed my ponytail roughly and inserted the drive into my neck port. Voice activate program 181, the man said in a breathy voice, coming back around to face me. I tried to reach around to yank the drive out of my neck, but I couldn't move. I was completely immobile. I'd still feel everything. I'd feel my arms and legs, but I couldn't move them. He reached out and put a sweaty hand on my face, then moved it slowly down my neck. What was going on? I tried to pull back or yell, but my lips didn't move and no sound came out. He started yelling. A chill ran down my still spine. No, I tried to yell. I knew he could deactivate me in an instant, and I could do nothing to stop him. He could upload anything through that drive and break my programming and hurt me in so many different ways, ways I couldn't even imagine. And I could only sit in mute horror, and my eyes stung in the strange way they did when I was scared or sad. I was suddenly sure that even though I didn't know exactly what was going on, something very bad was about to happen, and so, and I was powerless to stop it. My heart was hammering in my chest, but the monitor was silent, another result of whatever horrible hardware he invaded me with. Out of all the things I feared, this, whatever this was, hadn't even been on my list. My eyes were the only part of me that wasn't completely paralyzed, and I looked frantically around the room. There had to be something I could do, but all I could see was myself, alone and frozen in the room with a stranger I had absolute control. A stranger who was getting closer to me, wielding tools I had never seen before. I heard the high-pitched hum in my head, the same as when I had seen the girl falling from the platform. I paused. Of course. He might have my body trapped, but what was about my mind? My panic bubbled up and I embraced it, reaching out with my screaming thoughts to surround every contour of the side table lamp with my mind's humming energy. But I couldn't control it. I could never control it. The lamp exploded and my heart pounded in panic and dread. The man looked up, surprised at the noise. Terror made the buzzing in my brain explode. As the official let out a surprised gasp, the door crashed open and a lanky boy burst in. With a burst of fear, I immediately recognized the green-eyed boy. He scanned the room before finding a blanket, yanking it off the bed, and throwing it over the official, his arm wrapping around the man's neck in a tight V and squeezing. The man's arms fluttered uselessly, and then he crumpled forward and stopped moving. In my mind, I was screaming, but I still couldn't move. Couldn't even make a sound. The, gl the boy glanced my way and saw the terror shining in my eyes. I'm so sorry I didn't get here sooner, he said in a rush I didn't see until too late. See what? I wanted to ask, but my vocal cords were still paralyzed. The boy glanced back to see if I'd heard him, and his face went red. He ran over me. Oh, crack in hell. I'm sorry. Deactivate program 181, authoriz authorization code 5789345. As released. My hands flew to my face as I scrambled onto the floor. I quickly reached behind me to yank the foreign hardware out of my neck. No, don't! He half turned around me, holding out one hand. He stopped just short of touching me. Don't pull out the drive, or we'll both crack. My hand paused on my neck. How had he known about that? the drive? My sense of relief was immediately replaced by fear. Why shouldn't I? How do you know that code? Are you working with them? No, of course not, he said. Hurry, we don't have much time. I didn't need to be told twice. Whatever the boy's motivation, at least he'd freed me from the paralyzing control of the program. Who are you? I asked. What are you doing here? I'm Adrian, he said, and I can't tell you more than that right now. I adjusted my hair, careful not to dislodge, dislodge, sorry, dislodge the hardware in my neck. Are you from Central Systems? No shot in way, he said vehemently. I only want to help you. I pulled my arms tight against my chest, hugging myself and looking over at the misshaping misshapen lump on the bed. D d did you deactivate him? I whispered. Terror of all that had just happened truly started to sink in. <coughs> no, Adrian said. Attempted to, but an official's death would get more investigation. 
This way it just looks like he passed out. Speaking of, Adrian reached down and pulled something out of his bag. It was a small metal cylinder, a little bigger than a tablet stylus. He pulled off the cap and I could see two tiny needles sticking out the tip. He rolled the big man over and jammed the tip of the cylinder into his backside. I looked away and rubbed my neck, a shiver running down my back when I touched the foreign hardware again. So why can't I pull the drive out? I asked. Adrian looked back at me, carefully capping the needle and putting it back in the small black bag. Fit in, he said. You're just disconnected from the link and everything is being recorded separately on the drive. None of your vitals are registering, but the moment you pull it out, your skyrocketing, skyrocketing adrenaline and heart rate will get reported right to the doctors and central systems will get caught instantly. At the very least, they'll turn the god, gold lambed cameras in the wing back on. He pointed to the back circular desk on, discs on the ceiling. <clears throat> those are cameras? My stomach dropped. All the ceilings and hallways had those black dots. The underground tunnels, subway cars, my parents' dining room. He nodded, he nodded and held out his hand. Come on, let's get out of here. We go where? I asked, still shocked by the idea that I could be watched all the time, even when I was alone. Of course, it was obvious now that I thought of it. Fingerprint systems weren't enough to track subject movement. They wanted, they, they would want more comprehensive control. Whoever they were. I made the mistake of looking over at the man on the bed one last time. My hands were trembling. Was he about to deactivate me? felt something moist on my face. L I looked up instinctively to see if the ceiling was linking somehow. Then I touched my face and realized water was coming from my eyes. I pulled my hand back and stared at it in bewilderment. Couldn't handle another malfunction. Not today. Come on, Zoe, Adrian said. We gotta get the crack in hell out of here. I'll explain everything later. I promise. Panic seized my chest again. How did he know my name? Not just my name, but the short name I used in my private thoughts. I'd chosen it for myself when I was looking through the old text and found out it meant life, but he couldn't know that. Why'd you just call me that? He smiled distantly. It's a better fit. He held out his hand. I hesitated, looking first at the strong hand he held out to me and then at Sincerus's expression on his face. And then, the jolt of surprise, I realized he must be able to feel emotions. That was what I was seeing on his face. I wasn't imagining things this time. It was different from any person I'd ever met. His easy confidence, the life in his voice, the strange words he used. He was awake, alive. I didn't know him, didn't trust him, but I knew with all these anomalies what had just happened with the official, I'd be deactivated for sure if I stayed. My lungs squeezed at the thought. I didn't want that. The gray of being linked was bad enough, but what was beyond the gray? What was death like? I closed my eyes, trying to shut out the terror of the thought. Zoe, his voice was quiet, but I thought I could he hear fear behind it. I opened my eyes and grabbed his hand firmly. Okay. Adrian shut the door quietly behind us. He looked both ways down the dim hallways, then pulled me hard to the right, away from the elevator. I kept watch over my shoulder, as if any second someone would burst into the hallway and catch us. And then what would happen? Every moment it sank in more deeply that I had no clue how the world really worked. I was too in deep now, and the only thing that gave me the courage to keep moving forward was the slight pressure of Adrian's hand pulling mine. His touch was intentional, and somehow made me feel safe. We came to a dimly lit dead end. We had passed several closed doors as we went down the hallway, doors that could open any minute, and we'd be spotted immediately as um, anomalous. Still holding one of my hands, Adrian reached down into the crevice into the corner between two concrete slab walls. His fingers seemed to find something in the darkness, a button or some kind. Then he whispered, Open sub-level 1, manual override verification code 99945235. <clears throat> I held my breath, having no idea what to expect now. I almost jumped at the sudden grating noise behind us. A jolt of energy rushed down my arm, tingling in my hands. My head was still buzzing with fear. What was that? He turned slowly around us. Our way out. <clears throat> in the dim light, I could see a small smile on his face. He nodded towards the wall. My eyes followed him, and now, with amazement, there wasn't a wall in anywhere. Sorry. I stepped forward to examine it and see the wall had slid back on track and then rolled to one. Sorry, rolled to one side. It was pitch black in the tunnel beyond. My trembling started up again, but I kept going anyway. I kept a friend firm grip on Adrian's hand as he paused to close the panel behind us. 
The darkness was so dense and complete, it made the air feel heavy. <clears throat> I could feel it pressing down on me. It smelled strange, too. Kind of damp and sour, like spoiled milk. Nothing like the antiseptic clean of the hallway academies. I touched my forearm panel, and it lit up, lit up a small sphere in the darkness. I could barely make out two narrow walls leading forward into the black. Good idea. Adrian touched his arm panel as well. Come on. There was one room for one person at a time, so Adrian led the way. I was used to small spaces, but squeezing through the two-foot-wide tunnel was unnerving, even for me. I lifted my arm panel for light, but could only see the outline of Adrian's back. I noted with a sense of dread that there would be no easy escape if we got found in this narrow space. How far do we go? I whispered. I memorized the blueprints of the place. We'll walk about a hundred paces before we get to the next panel. How do you... Later. I'll answer any question you have later, but now I need you to focus on counting our footsteps so we don't miss the panel. I nodded, even though he couldn't see it. We started forward, and without thinking, I silently counted our steps to... My nervousness, I lost count somewhere in the 60s. Adrian, Adrian kept steadily leading me along, so I hope he knew where we were going. We were found. It would be impossible to explain logically. Adrian stopped suddenly. Now what? Now, I find the sensor switch. He searched up and down the wall with the light from the arm panel. I held mine up, too, for more light. Here we are, Adrian finally said. He sounded relieved, and I wasn't sure he was as certain as he seemed. He quickly whispered another activation code. I heard the scraping of rock again like we had heard before. Won't opening this door set off an alert somewhere? I asked, suddenly worried. What if we went all through this to find a squad of regulators waiting on the other side? We got this set up when I came on assignment here. This was always my emergency way out, of course, he said more to himself. I didn't expect to be using it already. Bit my lip before asking who we was. I imagine that was one of the many questions to be answered later. Okay, Adrian said. It's open. Come on. The light from our arms didn't penetrate very far into the open dark way. I took a step while Adrian closed the door behind us. I stumbled but caught myself before I fell. Cracking hell, he said. You okay? Fine, I went. Just stubbed my toe. Sorry, I should have warned you. This isn't a hallway. It's a staircase. The door finished closing behind us. Staircase? I raised my arm and saw the steep concrete stairwell. Yeah, I guess we're used to elevators. He seemed to sense my anxiety and went in front of me. There's no railing, so just keep a hand on the wall and follow close behind me. After we climbed more than 15 steps, I wondered just how much further there was to go, where exactly we were going. I tried not to think about the steep drop behind me, one that would surely kill me if I fell backwards. I lifted my other arm to hold the walls and with both hands for support. How much further? finally asked. I wasn't strained for breath. Everyone in the community did a long cardio workout every night. Healthy bodies meant a healthy community, after all. But my thigh muscles were cramping up. I was used to running on a treadmill, not stair climbing. <clears throat> not much, he said. He didn't sound under breath at all. Again, I was struck by the mystery of the boy. Who was he? How did he know so much? Why was he helping me? Before I could continue through the long list of questions racing through my mind, we reached a small four-by-four-foot plateau at the top of the staircase. Adrian found the switch easily this time and spoke the author authorization code. And then, as the last door swung open and my eyes were stung by blinding light, I learned the answer to at least one of my questions. Adrian wasn't trying to help me at all. He was trying to kill me. Chapter 3, everyone. Um, I'll try to record as soon as I can.